Easter Sunday night, 1973, Northwest had gone to a nearby school site for a Easter Sunday night service. And I had asked the deacons to meet with me after that service for just a few minutes. I needed two things. First of all, I said, I, I'm going to Portugal. I'm leaving in a little while, and I don't have enough money for my ticket. Will you authorize money out of the missions budget to send me over there? This is not a pleasure trip. This is business. I was on the overseas committee for Youth for Christ International at that time, and we had business in Portugal, and, and they said, yes, we can do that. And secondly... I said, since we are in all the planning stages for our new sanctuary, this was all in gear in 73. We were still meeting in the little chapel over here three times on a Sunday morning. And it was full up, and we knew we had to do something, and so all the lines were being drawn, and everything was in process. But I knew that people needed something in front. This was a huge step for us. This was 75 folks when I got here 26 years ago. And here we are filling that thing up three times over there, and we're talking about we need to do something else. And I hated building programs because I know what happens with building programs and churches. Uh, people get mad and get upset, and pastors leave, and all kinds of goofy things go on. And I didn't want to leave, and I don't want anybody getting mad, and I didn't know how to handle all that. I'd never run a program like that before. But I knew we needed something to remind us that things were going to happen. And so I got them together and I said, now guys, one of the things we're going to have to have when we get the new sanctuary built, we haven't turned one shovel of dirt yet, okay? When we get it built, we're going to need a new piano. And I want to buy it now, and I want to stick it in that little chapel over there, because I want every Sunday we come in, we are doing something big. And I said, I want you to listen to some pianos this week. And I want our day to take you down to the Stevenson Bradford Music Company and play all kinds and all prices of pianos for you while you're making this decision. But I want you to know this. There's a nine-foot Yamaha Concert Grand. That's what I want for us to buy. I want you to really think about that. It's $9,500. It's 1973. And they said, we'll go down and listen. There wasn't a lot of enthusiasm, but they said they'd go and listen. So I got on the plane and I flew to New York. And on the way, I read a brand new book. It was entitled, The Seven Last Words of the Church. It's kind of an upfront kind of deal. Somebody looking at what was happening at the church and what needed to happen. And the seven last words of the church are, we never did it that way before. And I read that book, and I thought, our guys need this, because I don't know where we're going, how we're going to get there, but our guys need to read this book. So I called Jay Stevens, who was my associate in those days. I said, Jay, go to the Bible house, buy eight copies of that book, one for you and one for each of the deacons, take them around, give them to them, and tell them to have that read by the time I get home from Portugal. He said, okay. Later on, I heard the story. But when he went to Mal Diorian, was one of our deacons in those days. Mal is with the Lord now, great friend, wonderful guy. But when he got to Mal and handed him the book, Buf wants you to read this book, Mal's response, and I quote, If Buf thinks that me reading that book is going to make me vote yes to buy a $9,500 piano, he's crazy as hell. That's his quote, deacon. That's a deacon quote. <laughs> book didn't say a thing about pianos of any price, but he was struggling with change. Just parenthetically, I want you to know something. This is that $9,500 piano that has served us faithfully for about 22 years. You've got to buy one of these now. It's 80000 bucks. Okay. Did we make a good investment? I mean, did the guys that said, look, it's going to cost more later, they're true, right on the money, and then all of, and some of those guys are saying, ah, it's just sales talk, you know, all our self price, but hey, it really did go up. Great piano, it's in great shape, we've had it all redone a little over a year ago, it's beautiful, doing great and wonderful work. But see, that struggling against change is so normal for us to battle against it. And there's the possibility, the strong possibility, that in this congregation we have people that are struggling right now with change. We've got some change in personnel. we got some change in program. we got some change in schedule. We're going to four services on the 6th day of August, 7, 15, 8, 30, 10 o'clock, 11, 30. We're going to tell you more about that later. That's all going to happen because 
We believe that God wants us to open the doors a little wider and reach out to more people that need to know Jesus Christ as Savior, and we can't do it in three services. This is summertime. Look around. It's a great crowd. Great crowd. And so as I thought about all of that, I thought, I need to get to the Scriptures, and I need to uh, take a look at some people, people of great courage, men who were involved in change and set kind of a really good pace for us all. And I go to Abraham. Now, Abraham's one of the great ones in the Scriptures. And you find him in Genesis chapter 12. And if you did Bethel anywhere along the way, this Genesis 12 is very familiar to you. God had told Abraham, leave your own country behind you and your own people and go to the land I will guide you to. Now you listen to that. Abraham's 75 years old. He says, pick it up, kid. Your family, everything you own. The guy's a rich dude. He's got silver and gold, and he has got livestock. You can't hardly count the livestock the guy has. This is hundreds of miles, and God doesn't even tell him where he's going. God said, pick it up and move, and I'll show you the place. And God goes on to say, if you do, I'll cause you to become the father of a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous, and you'll be a blessing to many others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and the entire world will be blessed because of you. Big deal. Change. And the next verse says, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed him. Isn't that a kick? Obedience. Obedience. Simple, simple stuff. Obedience. Well, you go over to the 15th chapter of Genesis. He's 90 years old here. He's been down here in Canaan for these years. A lot of things have gone on. But Jehovah came to speak to Abram in a vision. And this is what the Lord told him. He said, don't be fearful. I will defend you, and I'll give you great blessings. And Abram said, Oh, Lord, what good are all your blessings when I have no son? For without a son, some other member of my household will inherit all my wealth. Those were the rules in that day. His number one servant, the top guy in his organization, would inherit everything he had if he didn't have a son. And Jehovah told him, No. No one else will be your heir, for you will have a son to inherit everything you own. And then God took Abram outside beneath the nighttime sky and told him, look up into the heavens and count the stars if you can. I mean, he's over there in a place where it's dark at night. There are no big lights in the city showing. You know how it is? When you get out there where it's really dark at night and you look up, and those stars look like they're laying on a black velvet cloth. Well, he says, Abram, count them if you can. Your descendants will be like that. Too many to count. Now, earlier God had said to him, I'm going to give you descendants. Just kick the dust there, Abraham, because I'm going to give you more than you can count than the dust on the ground. By the millions, you are going to have descendants. The guy doesn't have a, have a son yet. And God's giving him this story when he's 75. When he's 90, he's giving him this story. He says here that Abram believed God then God considered him righteous on account of his faith. Now let me tell you something God has not changed in. The only way to do business with God Almighty is to believe him. Simple belief that he's telling you the truth. And you will believe him and follow his word. Because Abram did this, we go to that Romans passage. Year, hundreds of years later, and here he's talking to these Jewish folks, and he says to them, what were Abram's experiences concerning the question of being saved by faith? Was it because of his good deeds that God accepted him? If so, then he would have something to boast about. But from God's point of view, Abraham had no basis at all for pride, for the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God, and that is why God canceled his sins and declared him not guilty. You hear that? Because of his faith, he believed God, and God canceled his sins and declared him not guilty. What a marvelous system. Only God Almighty can put this together. And he's put it together 
And here he once again reminds us here in the book of Romans about Abraham's great commitment to God. In Galatians, we read that Abraham had this experience, that God declared him fit for heaven only because he believed God's promises. You can see from this that the real children of Abraham are all the people of faith who truly trust in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would say the Gentiles also, that's us, through their faith. God told Abraham about this long ago when he said, I will bless those in every nation who trust in me as you do. And so it is, all who trust in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received. We quote the verse out of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, because of God's kindness, you've been saved through trusting Christ. Salvation is not a reward for the good we have done, so none of us can take any credit for it. It's God himself who made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus, and long ages ago he planned we should spend these lives in helping others. See, this wonderful plan that operates on one thing, it operates on faith. And if some of you sitting here this morning, you've never made that move toward God. You've heard a lot. You kind of hear Jim Riley. Jim Riley was a, a businessman here in town years ago. He was a great fun guy. He was smart enough to run a business and keep it small enough so it didn't cover him up. He could get a little time for himself. He was the most fun guy there was to go play 18 holes of golf because he didn't come with a whole sack full of stories that he'd heard and tell you stories all day. Jim saw something funny in everything that happened. Tremendous guy. And he came to my office one day and he said, Beef, I don't know what's going on. He said, I come to Sunday church. I come to Thursday morning Bible study. I even read the assignment you give sometimes. You know, that always kind of bowls me over when folks confess that. He said, man, I don't get it. I don't think I'm hooked in. Somehow, I don't, I don't think whatever's supposed to happen has happened to me. I said, Jim, one question. Have you ever knelt before the Lord and said, Lord, it's old Jim. I am a sinner, and I know it. Will you forgive me my sins because I come in the name of Jesus Christ? Accept me into your family. And he just sat there and he looked at me. He said, you mean it's that easy? I said, I can't believe you've been listening to me preach all this time and you haven't caught that. That's basic truth, man. That's how you get into the family of God. And he knelt and he prayed and he invited Jesus Christ into his life that day. And he's with the Lord today because a year and a half later he was diagnosed with cancer and in a period of about a year and a half he died. But he died knowing who he was in Christ because he had made that commitment to Jesus Christ and not just been a good fellow going to church and hearing the word. See, there's some like that here right now. You've been hearing the word, hearing the word, hearing the word, but you've never made the move to say, I need to put Jesus Christ in the leadership role in my life. I will trust him. I will ask God to forgive me for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, and I will find access into the family of God. And until you make that move, until you make that change, you will still be in your sins struggling with God Almighty who is perfect, who absolutely will not put up with those who try to come in their own sense of righteousness and worth because we have none. Third, just one more thing. I've got to tell you this. this is, you talk about change. Genesis 17. Abraham's 99 years old now, and he still doesn't have that son. 75, 90, 99. When he's 99, chapter 17, God appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty. Obey me and live as you should. I will prepare a contract between us. Oh, ho. I will prepare a contract between us, guaranteeing to make you into a mighty nation. In fact, you shall be the father of not only one nation, but a multitude of nations. 
And God said, I'm going to change your name. It's no longer Abram, meaning exalted father, but Abraham, meaning father of nations. For that's what you will be. I have declared it. I will give you millions of descendants who will form many nations. Kings shall be among your descendants. And I will continue this agreement between us generation after generation forever, for it shall be between me and your children as well. It is a contract that I shall be your God and the God of your posterity, and I will give all this land of Canaan to you and them forever, and I will be your God. A God-initiated contract. It's an entire deal. All it needs is for you to say, deal. And then God says, your part of the contract is to obey its terms. Now, is that simple enough? You personally, and then he starts getting specific, you personally and all your posterity have this continual responsibility. And then he carefully outlines what that is. And when I was a kid and going to church and pastors preached on this, I used to say, don't say that in church. Because the next verse says that every male among you shall be circumcised. The foreskin of his penis shall be cut off. This will be the proof that you and they accept this covenant. Every male shall be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. And I used to think, oh, come on, preach, don't do that. Sunday. There's a lot of women here. And a lot of men here. A lot of us little boys here, and we don't know what's going on here. Why do you preach it? Hey, this is the Word of God. God said, I've got this contract. It's all together. All you've got to do is accept it. And there's one thing in your part of the contract. Obey its term. And here is the badge. Here is the thing you do that says, yes, I agree to the contract. I will simply be obedient to God. Now, I have wondered what kind of discussion must have gone on between God and Abraham. You know, I'm wondering if Abraham said, dear Lord, have mercy. What kind of goofy deal is this? Well, you know, it might be the kind of goofy deal. Kind of interesting. They lived in a heathen population and anything went. I mean, anything went. We think we think we got immoral situations now. They stacked the deck in their worship things with all kinds of immorality. Shot through and through with that. God wants a reminder, you're about to get involved with somebody in, a more, in an immoral situation. Here's a reminder, you belong to me. Hmm. What's he do? God does one other thing here. God says, uh, I want to remind you one more thing, Abraham. You're going to be a father. I told Abraham, throws himself down in the desk. He says, me, a father, at a hundred? I'll be a hundred years old the time this kid is born. If I go and get Sarah pregnant today, I'll be a hundred years old the time that kid shows up, and she'll be 90. And he's laughing, and he's got a little disbelief going, and so on. And God said, see ya. And he took off. That very day, Abraham and every other male born in his household or brought from outside cut off their foreskins just as God had told him to. Abraham was 99 years old at the time. That's interesting. God didn't throw a bunch of numbers in the hat and say on the eighth day this is to happen. The medical people know now that the highest clotting procedure time the best is on the eighth day they didn't have all the modern means to use that we have today to cause the clotting to happen but on that day there must have been a special day of grace for old 99 year old Abram and all these other guys that are, are circumcised on that day as their part of the contract change that is that is tremendous change you say, so what's that mean to us today? Well, you know what the sign of the contract is today? It's baptism. The scripture says clearly we are to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. And there are scores of people in this congregation that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. You've gone through Timothy. You've done the whole deal when it comes to baptism. You say, I think this is good enough. You don't think, hey, the scripture says baptism is an important step of obedience. That's what we're talking about. 
is obedience. And people say, well, I could never stand up there and give my testimony. Why not? Could if you would. Well, my hair will be all messed up. Yeah, it will. Big deal. You see, we're talking about obedience. And some of you believers have really stopped growing and developing because you have set yourself to say, I'm not going to be obedient. I was baptized when I was a baby. You didn't even know it. You didn't know a baptism then from being washed in the sink. And you're trying to tell me it counts. That dog won't hunt, friend. There's no way that works. Baptism comes after belief. And it's obedience to the Lord. It's saying, I will obey the Lord. And I simply want you to read Romans 4 this week. And think about how the obedience plan is going in your life. See, there are two kinds of people here that I'm concerned about this morning. First of all, I'm concerned about that person that has listened to sermon after sermon after sermon, but has never yet said, I am ready to give my heart to Jesus Christ. Somebody help me. We put those cards in the rack for you. Ask you to fill them out, turn them in. We'll have someone sit with you and show you out of the Word how you can become a member of the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, the believers here that ought to be baptized. Believers that ask, boy, did he punch my lights out today. I have never taken that step of obedience. I have resisted it. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I know that I'm saved. But I know that I'm disobedient. And I ought not to be. I challenge you. Pull a card in that rack and get it filled out that you want to talk to somebody about baptism. I believe God has greater days for us ahead of ministry in this city and this county than we ever even dreamed of. The whole move to four services is not to be the biggest thing in the block. It's to open the doors wider for those that need to know Jesus Christ. That's my heart. And that's why we're making the move. And as our people get obedient to God, we're going to be absolutely amazed at the things that God does. In the meantime, our folks are struggling with change. It's a difficult time for them and for me. I'm praying that folks will come and follow and understand what leadership is all about and come to the party and expect God to overwhelm us with his grace. Father, we're thankful for this morning. We're thankful for just the great and wonderful privilege to open your word and to find a man of courage and a man willing to change in, in so many areas as Abraham. Rich, he could have said, I don't need all this change. Old, could have said, I'm not built for change. Strong, he could have said, leave me alone, I'm doing okay. I think I'll make it on my own. But instead of that, he believed God and he participated in his part of the contract. So I pray for folks here that need to know Jesus Christ that ought to, ought to pull a card out of that rack and fill it out right now. Stick it in one of these boxes so we can get to them this week. I pray for believers that have not been, been willing to obey you yet by going into the waters of baptism and openly and publicly declaring their faith and their obedience by that move. That they'd fill out a card that we could make the time with them to follow you in this manner. Lord, we thank you for today and the great privilege we have to worship together. It's been great. Bless us as we go. We'll give you thanks in the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Great to be with you. Take care. Get signed up for three on three. Sign up your kids for five days of fun and do all the other good stuff. Thanks. Bye-bye.